also, I have a license to practice psychology issued by the North Carolina Psychology Board. I guarantee you they regret the day they ever gave me a license. <laughs> the reason they do, and I'm serious, the reason they do is because I go around the country and I tell people the truth that we wouldn't be having one-tenth of the problems we are having with American children today if American parents had not started listening to psychologists beginning in the 1960s tell them how to raise kids. John Roseman has worked with families, children, and parents since 1971 in the field of family psychology. Presently, his time is devoted to speaking and writing John is syndicated in approximately 225 newspapers nationwide. He has written 11 best-selling parenting books. He's also known for his sound advice, humor, easy, relaxed, engaging style, and you're going to discover that today. He's also the father of two successful adults and the grandfather, I like this best, of seven children. Let's welcome John Roseman back to Mid-South Viewpoint. John, Happy New Year. Welcome to the show. Happy New Year to you, Byron, and and to everyone listening. You're coming to Memphis, and we're going to give some details about that visit in just a second. But before we get started, let's talk about your collection of Trafalgar suspenders. So you're not a belt man. (laughs) How did you find out about that? Hey, I have ways of finding things out. (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. Um, I started collecting Trafalgar suspenders, braces, as they're called, in England where they're made. Oh gosh, it was about 20 years ago. I was giving my business to a men's store in Charlotte and the salesperson there introduced me to the concept of not wearing a belt, but wearing uh, these very artistically done, designed, limited edition, blah, 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 suspenders, if you will, by Trafalgar and started wearing them and just loved them. Don't wear them as much as I used to. It's hard to find them. Oh, is it? Well, I went to their online store, and I wasn't real familiar, but they're pretty classy looking. Yeah, yeah, they're very classy looking. You almost have to go online these days because so few people are wearing braces these days that it just doesn't pay for a store to uh, keep them in, in stock. Well, I'll tell you, John, with all the heavy things I keep in my pocket, sometimes I need a pair of those to keep my pants up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, they're very stylish. Yeah, they are stylish. They look really nice. Hey, your preferred grocery stores are Publix, Fresh Market, and Trader Joe's. What do you find most appealing about these particular stores? Um, actually, the two stores that, that I would go to uh, constantly if, if they were in my area, I'm in New Bern, North Carolina now, Byron. When you and I met before several years ago, I was in the Charlotte area. My wife and I moved to New Bern, where uh, our pick of grocery stores is very limited. We have a Publix and a Harris Teeter here, and a Food Lion, and a Piggly Wiggly. Oh, and, my. Uh, you know, Piggly Wiggly got its start here in Memphis. Carl Sanders was the originator of the really? grocery stores. And matter of fact, yeah, there's a demo at the Pink Palace Museum here in Memphis. Maybe when you come, if you've got time, you can stop by. But he started Piggly Wiggly. Yeah, it seems like I've read something about that and very interesting story anyway i just like them because they're kind of offbeat not public but trader joe's and the fresh market are kind of offbeat and i like just kind of offbeat things generally. well the germantown community is negotiating right now a deal with trader joe's and hopefully by the end of this year there'll be a trader joe's in the memphis area yeah it's really a great store i mean you can go in there and you can get pre-fix dinners. If anyone's ever been to England, the concept in the grocery department at Harrods department store, and where you go in there and you just, and this is what a lot of people in London do after work, they just go to Harrods, pick up dinner, take it home, and and it's uh, already prepared. Yeah, so Trader Joe's is very much like that. As a psychologist, have you spent any time psychoanalyzing the way grocery stores are set up and the way people participate in their experience at grocery stores? You know, I am a psychologist by license, Byron, but I don't <laughs> believe in psychology. I don't look at anything psychologically. I think that psychology has been a wrecking ball in American culture, and I don't think there's any room for it in a Christian worldview. So I have a license to practice psychology issued by the North Carolina Psychology Board. I guarantee you they regret the day 
family ever gave me a license. <laughs> the reason they do, and I'm serious, the reason they do is because I go around the country and I tell people the truth that we wouldn't be having one-tenth of the problems we are having with American children today if American parents had not started listening to psychologists beginning in the 1960s tell them how to raise kids. Well, you're coming to Memphis January 22nd through the 23rd for a parenting conference, also an educator seminar at the Bornblum Jewish Community Center. Now, tickets can be ordered online at Bornblum, and that's B-O-R-N-B-L-U-M dot O-R-G. You can also call 901-747-2665, and we'll be talking about the details throughout the show. But that first meeting, John, on Sunday afternoon, January 22nd from 2 to 5, you're going to be talking about parenting with love and leadership. You'll also be on that Monday evening talk about parenting the strong-willed teen, and then that Monday afternoon session with educators, classroom management, and leadership. Now, when you say a parent is to love their child, besides providing food, clothing, and shelter, the necessities, How does a parent best prove their love for their child? Well, you best prove your love for your child by giving the child unconditional love and unequivocal discipline. The problem in the American family today, Byron, is that we, and again, this traces back to the demonization of traditional forms of discipline and a traditional approach to discipline by the mental health community in America beginning in the 1960s. With no evidence whatsoever, they said that traditional approaches and traditional forms of discipline were psychologically harmful. We now know that they are not, but this propaganda was extremely effective, and it caused the American parent, not all of them, but all too many, to believe that the proper raising of a child was all about love. And when you believe that, you end up becoming an enabler. Love without leadership, without discipline is enabling. The flip side of that is that discipline without love is abusive. I just want to interrupt you just for a second, John. I remember the late Adrian Rogers shared a story about this very topic about parents allowing their kids to basically do whatever without discipline. And he said, you know, if Johnny wants to cut the legs off the coffee table, make sure you have the saw blade sharp for him. Yeah. And we're now reaping the consequences, the predictable consequences of what the type of parenting that America has embraced over the last uh, 30 years. We're looking at millennials, young people who go to college and complain of microaggressions and trigger events and things like this and need safe spaces. And it's a tragic thing that the kids are not to blame. The parents are not to blame either. The blame, I believe, falls on my profession. And the thing is that my profession refuses to say it was wrong about any of this stuff. You know, doctors will say they were wrong about their theories concerning disease. Physicists will say that they were wrong concerning their theories uh, regarding the universe and particle physics. Chemists will say that they are wrong. Biologists will say, no, psychologists will not say you will never hear the profession of psychology say that it was wrong. It is the most uh, narcissistic profession on the planet, in my estimation. And this is what I do, Byron. I go around the country and I try to help people recover from the devastating effects on the American family that psychology has had. Well, in his book, Raising Children That Other People Like to Be Around, Richard Greenberg suggests that parenting is like driving a cab. If you don't at least act like you know the way, your passengers or children are going to be nervous and uncomfortable as you would be with a rookie cab driver. But doesn't it take more than acting like we know how to parent to parent? Well, it does. But And I agree with what Richard Greenberg has said. I'm not familiar with the book, but I, I agree completely with your representation of his position on that issue. It does take more than simply acting like you know what you're doing. But in fact, effective authority figures, effective people who are in leadership positions anywhere in the Army, corporate America, education, the ministry, it doesn't matter. Wherever you find people who are effective leaders, you find people who understand that you can't always know that you are doing the right thing, but you must always act 
like you know you are doing the right thing. And indeed, if you don't, with a child, two things happen. One, the child learns how to manipulate you, and number two, because the child sees a parent who is tremendously anxious and indecisive, this begins to cause problems with the child's own mental health after a while. What are some mistakes too often made, John, when a parent tries to establish their leadership role in the home? Well, the biggest mistake that parents are making these days is thinking psychologically about their children's misbehavior. Instead of simply doing something about it in unequivocal, forceful, and I'm not talking about physical, but forceful uh, ways, what they do is they interpret their children's misbehavior and the interpretation of the behavior leads them into a, a theoretical, abstract realm, and the result is what I call disciplinary paralysis. These are parents who don't know what to do because they don't understand the problem. I tell parents all the time, it, it isn't necessary to understand anything more than children come into the world naturally inclined toward self-centeredness, toward wanting their own way, toward pragmatism, to believing because they deserve what they want, the ends justify the means. And this is what you're dealing with. You don't have to understand anything more than that. And discipline is all about letting children know unequivocally and forcefully, and again, not physically necessarily, but forcefully, that you will not tolerate antisocial behavior from a child from age two on. This is when discipline ought to start, is at age two. What are the core principles a parent needs to focus on for providing that proper leadership in the home? Well, the core principles are the same regardless, and that is that you are decisive. You're more focused on decisiveness than you are on always making the right decision. And by the way, if you're decisive, you will make the right decision 95% of the time and that is uh, all that can be expected of the very best parent in the world. It's decisiveness, it's, uh, it's letting children know clearly what it is that you want and expect from them. You know, today's parents, Byron, are making very small mistakes, but the accumulation of small mistakes leads to one huge big problem, small mistakes. Ending what you think is an instruction to a child with the word okay with a question mark after it. Billy, it would be very helpful if uh, you would pick up your toys. Will you do that for mommy? Okay. Unbeknownst to the parent, that is not an instruction. That is a request. You're asking the child to consider something. Small mistake. Explaining yourself to your child. Whenever parents come to me, Byron, and tell me that they have an argumentative child, I say, no, you don't. Your child is not argumentative. And the parents will look at me and go, well, John, you don't even know my child. And I go, well, I do know children. I don't know your child, but I know children very well. And here's what I know about children. Children's parents call them argumentative when the parents in question explain themselves to their children. And the explanation is what causes the argument. It's not anything about the child. It's you are explaining yourself, and you're explaining yourself because you have uh, ingested one of the most powerful of all 1960s parenting memes, which is that children deserve reasons. Well, they deserve reasons for things like why the sun appears to rise in the morning and set in the evening and why it rains sometimes and so on and so forth. They don't deserve reasons for the instructions and expectations that you convey to them. What about your upbringing, John? What type of leadership model did your parents show you growing up? They showed me what to do right and what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were not perfect parents by any means. Um, but, you know, that's the interesting thing. People come to me sometimes and I say, well, John, I didn't have a good role model uh, myself, and I don't feel, you know, a whole lot of security when it comes to parenting. And I go... The fact that you know that you had an inadequate role model as of where your own parents were concerned means that you know exactly what is the right thing to do 
in any given situation, stop using your parents as an excuse for the mistakes that you make. You know, whether you had good role models or bad role models, you know what to do. Yeah. Hey, I was having lunch yesterday with a friend who has a preteen who regularly displays grown-up actions and attitude and decision-making, but will, you know, at times throw those childish curveballs by mistreating their younger siblings. How can this parent help to build a consistent behavioral pattern with this child? Well, sibling conflict is inevitable, just like a certain degree of marital conflict is inevitable. Byron, um, sibling conflict becomes sibling rivalry when a parent gets involved. And the parent's involvement results in one child being identified as the villain and the other child being identified as the victim. And the villain never believes that he has been blamed justly, so he looks for further opportunities to take revenge on the sibling. The victim looks for opportunities to be a victim again. So uh, when parents get involved in sibling conflict, instead of just saying to children, work it out, and if you can't work it out quietly, you're both going to your rooms for the remainder of the day, and going to bed right after dinner. You know, something as simple as that, where you just put both of the kids, hold them equally responsible, put them both in the same boat. If you do that, they'll figure it out. They'll learn how to get along. But as long as you get involved and identify one child as the villain and the other as the victim, you've kicked a snowball rolling downhill. Yeah. What about advice to parents raising their children with biblical values that are living in this culture that's opposite of those values? Maybe their kids are being bullied or put down because of their belief in Christ. Well, you know, I've never really heard that, that kids are being bullied because of belief in Christ. I mean, uh, it it may be happening somewhere, but bullying has um, escalated tremendously since the days when I was in elementary and high school. And one of the reasons is because of social media, which I more accurately term anti-social media. You know, with uh, very few minutes left in the program, Byron, we've ripped a, uh, uh, the lid off of a can of worms here. If I was a parent today, I would never allow my children to have a smartphone. They could have a dedicated cell phone, a flip phone that wouldn't text, and wouldn't get on the internet and I'd give it to them whenever I wanted them to have a phone for practical purposes they would never have video games they would never be allowed to go over to somebody else's house to play video games they would not have televisions in their rooms and they would watch no more than two hours of television a week if you take and again this is a whole nother show but uh, parents who have had the courage to remove these technologies from their children's lives consistently tell me that parenting is 100% easier after they have done so. That's a good word, John. And as you mentioned, our time is slipping away, and I've got, boy, I've got tons of stuff I want to talk to you about, but the reason you're coming to Memphis on January 22nd, 23rd, the afternoon of the 23rd, Monday afternoon, January 23rd, You're going to do a seminar with educators, exclusively for educators in our community, concerning classroom management. Now, what are the keys to managing the classroom with so many distractions that occur? And often, there's a respect of authority issue that many teachers struggle with due to poor home climate that the students live in. Oh, gosh. You you know, Byron, uh, that's another whole show. You, You really can't do anything effective about a child's classroom misbehavior if you don't have full parental support. Uh, My parents, if they heard a 40 or 50 something year old teacher report negatively on my behavior, acted on the negative report. Today's parents, by and large, when they hear these negative reports, they become their children's advocates and attorneys and uh, they defend their children and not to go into the long explanation of why this is happening. But again, it traces back to the psychological parenting revolution that took place in the the 1960s and early 70s. My sister-in-law teaches third graders in Alabama, and she says her biggest challenge is dealing with parents' lack of support more than the students' behavior. 
Well, this is what I hear from principals, headmasters, teachers all over America. Children are not the problem. The problem in, in, the, in American education today is parents. It's parents who will not accept that their children can be really bad. And they can't accept it because they think that if uh, their children are really bad, that means they're really bad. And the fact of the matter is that good parents can raise kids who do really bad things. But you get this defensiveness because uh, this, this bogus Freudian theory has uh, crept its way into American parenting uh, over the last 50 years or so. How can leadership address these issues of better communication between teachers and principals and school administrators? Well, the, the key is for school administrators to assume a proper leadership function in the school. But uh, today, unfortunately, Byron, in public schools especially, the job of the principal is to keep lawyers from coming in the front door. Principals all over America have told me this, that fear rules in educational administration these days. We're very unfortunate. And it's fear of what parents will do if they don't... Uh, feel like they're getting a satisfactory resolution concerning the uh, the snowflakes that they're raising. Is there one particular thing that seems to be the greatest breakdown in the classroom management? Uh, it's the uh, emphasis on the teacher having a good relationship with the student. You know, one of the things about leadership, Byron, is that people who effectively function in leadership positions, they are polite, courteous, uh, respectful, concerned, but they do not enter into intimate relationships or close relationships with the people that they're leading. But this is the new model, and it has been in American education since the late 60s, is the, uh, the teacher-student relationship model. And this is why we have students evaluating teachers today. I mean, it's absurd. Uh, you know, a, a uh, 13-year-old knows enough to evaluate his or her teacher, um, that's absurd. It's absolutely ridiculous. And it's crippling American public education, this sort of thing. Well, John Roseberg, you're coming to Memphis on Sunday, January 22nd, for a meeting with parents about parenting with love and leadership. That'll take place in the afternoon at the Bornblum Jewish Community Center. Our friends can get tickets by going online at born, B-O-R-N, Blum, B-O-U-M dot O-R-G, or you can call this number at 901-747-2665, 901-747-2665. John, of course, you had this first meeting Sunday afternoon, and then there's going to be a Monday evening meeting at the same location you will be uh, talking about parenting the strong-willed teen that'll take place from 7 to 8 30 on january the 23rd and then the afternoon on the 23rd you'll be meeting with educators on classroom management and leadership any thoughts or comments about any of these sessions you'll be conducting no but uh not in particular but i will tell our, our listening audience that uh i i throw a lot of humor into my presentations and so it's they're kind of balanced a humorous, educational, provocative. You may not always agree with what I say, but uh, you, you won't be bored, I guarantee you. Hey, are you working on any new books, and, and do you actually write your own material? Oh, yeah, I write all my own, own material. I don't use any ghostwriters. I am working on three books uh, simultaneously at the present time. That's pretty typical. I'll work on two or three books, publish one, and then finish the other two and publish those. So uh, this is typical. Got to ask you this, John. What is your favorite thing about being a granddad? Uh, my favorite thing about being a granddad is just that, uh, you know, you're in a different role. You're in more of a mentoring role with your grandchildren. And uh, it's a much more relaxed role. And so they tend to listen to you at uh, whatever age. They tend to listen to you better than they uh, will listen to their own parents. It's, it's uh, kind of interesting and fun. We have one granddaughter. She'll be four at the end of this month. She calls me Poppy, and we have more fun. I like to take her on dates. 
I took her recently to the Orpheum Theater, and we saw the Broadway production of Annie, you know. And then one time I took her out to a movie and took her bowling. I just love having that opportunity to influence her life, you know, and not just about activity, but just spending time with her, playing with her in her room with her dolls, you know. I mean, it is fun being a poppy. Oh, I know, and uh, it sounds like tremendous fun. I used to do the same thing with my daughter, take her out on dates. It's a great thing. It's a great gift to a, to a daughter or granddaughter to uh, teach them at an early age how men ought to treat them. It's a valuable lesson that you're imparting to your, to your granddaughter. Congratulations, Byron. Thanks, John. Well, how can we learn more about John Roseman, about your books? Uh, you have a website, I believe. Yeah, it's just John Roseman, J-O-H-N-R-O-S-E-M-O-N-D dot com. Okay. Of course, you're writing for those 225 publications around the country, so I'm sure coming to a newspaper or a magazine near you, too. The column used to be in the Memphis paper. I don't know if it is still anymore or not, but it used to be. And um, I'm still traveling the country fairly extensively. My speaking schedule is uh, on my website. All right, John Roseman, God bless you. Thank you for what you're doing for Christ's kingdom to encourage families with God's word and the biblical instruction of raising families. Thank you so much for joining Mid-South Viewpoint here on Bot Radio. Well, thanks for inviting me, Byron. I've enjoyed it. Friends, that's all the time we have on this edition of Mid-South Viewpoint. Thanks for stopping by. I'm Byron Tyler. Hey, we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.